afternoon and why. Farron of Falcherovaleg, a massive welcome to you all. And on behalf of the Donegal People's Assembly, we'd like to firstly thank you so much for taking the time to come here tonight. And we're really looking forward to hearing your views and opinions on a united Ireland. And I am now going to hand over to our Donegal TD and Sinn Féin spokesman on finance. Can you give a massive Donegal welcome to our very own Pierce Doherty? Rosa, I guess, um, just the our project in Shaw is boiling by his heart on Koshe, Agrihan, a heart, good war, Ishala, Shaw, Gru, and Artigas, the Magankamahan Shaw, Earl Went, he and Shaw, Sabalar, I guess, Farin of Welcher, Rove Lake. I want to thank you for all joining us here and being part of the People's Assembly. And I think your presence is evidence of the growing momentum in relation to the conversation of the future of Ireland. Uh, and we meet tonight in, in Bala Buffet, and we're very conscious that we do so in the context of an ongoing cost of living crisis for many people. For decades, we in this county of Donegal and indeed the North West understand that we've suffered under successive governments. We've experienced marginalisation, we've experienced economic disadvantage, and we continue to grapple with the failures to invest in critical infrastructure, whether that is in our country roads, whether that is in our rail infrastructure, whether that is in public transport, or indeed broadband, or many other examples. We see our Gaeltar communities, our rural communities, our small towns, our small villages, all have experienced the heartache of young people being forced to emigrate due to the lack of jobs, the lack of opportunities, and indeed now because of the issues in terms of housing uh, in our own county. And, and Donegal children, we know, wait years uh, for health care while our uh, elderly wait uh, far too many of them on trolleys as services suffer due to chronic underinvestment. And, and we now have the obscenity of hundreds upon hundreds of families living in dangerous conditions due to defective concrete block scandal. The disadvantage is exasperated by partition. It's made all the worse as a result of it. A partition that cuts Donegal off from our natural hinterland uh, off the northwest. Partition and unequal development across the 26 counties has led to this marginalisation, isolation, low employment and indeed poverty. And even with these challenges, there are excellent success stories in the middle of all of that uh, in Donegal. Uh, and the county has a lot to be proud of, of its people, of its successes, of how we've been able to battle through some of the issues that I have mentioned. And our panel here tonight is testament to those successes uh, and I want to thank each and every one of them for making their time available uh, to come to share their thoughts uh, and, and to take uh, questions and to be part of to, to today's debate. I look forward to their insights and indeed their contributions um, and indeed your contributions from the audience as well because this is a people's assembly. In my view there's potential, there's massive potential for the further development of Donegal and indeed the country in a, U, in a new United Ireland and that's why I'm here tonight to continue that conversation and to plan for the future. Constitutional change is now fixed in the political horizon. Brexit, electoral realignment, opinion polls, uh, and the most recent census, they have all showing and all, have all contributed uh, to that prospect. And of course, that doesn't mean that Irish unity is inevitable. It's not. But the discussion has become more dominant in the political discourse. And that's the context in which we in Sinn Féin hold this People's Assembly. We want to encourage grassroots participation in the conversation about a shared future. Everyone should have their say. Uh, and those who advocate for Irish unity, those who are undecided, and yes, including those who oppose change. A vast amount of academic research, uh, modelling, new studies, books have even been written on all aspects of reunification, uh, and there are more that are currently being produced. Conversations, as we know, are happening not just in this county, but right across the island and indeed beyond the island in relation to constitutional change. It's happening in our workplaces, it's happening in our universities, it's happening at the school gates, it's happening at the match on Sundays. People are talking and they're demanding change. And there's now an irresistible case for the Irish government to establish a citizens' assembly on constitutional change. A citizens' assembly has an important role to play in preparing the groundwork uh, 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 in, in, in advancing 
the, call, the, the cause and indeed the need for a unity referendum. It's an exciting time for all of us, and particularly those of us who are Republican. It's an exciting time that is filled with opportunity, uh, and an opportunity and hope of a better future. And that's why we need to get it right. Achieving a new constitutional national democracy will emerge from a phased transition. And that is why systematic planning and preparation should start now. Not leaving it till the very end, but it needs to start now. Grassroots community need to be involved at the very beginning and not an afterthought and consulted just at the end of the process. These assemblies are about inviting working people, inviting trade unionists and business owners, community activists, women, our youth, our LGBTQ people, Gaelgari academics, representatives of our new communities and others to come together to have their say on the process of change. Our shared challenge must be to create a future which is warm and welcoming for everyone. And that means asking and answering the questions that are being asked about a united Ireland. So the questions I'm here and the questions that are being put is, can we protect public services? Can we protect pensions and create decent jobs and pay? Can we create an Irish national health system? I believe we can. Can we negotiate and, and agree a new constitutional democratic arrangements and structures which will leave no one behind? Absolutely. And can we tackle sectarianism? Can we open up a new phase of our peace process based on reconciliation and healing? The answer is we can and we must. So we all have a responsibility to reach out to unionism and to ensure those who are for maintaining the union with Britain that there is a better way. That Irish unity is the route back to the European Union. And those of us who aspire to see a united Ireland need to create the space in this conversation for those who disagree. And that's really, really important. We need to create that space for people who disagree or who need reassurance. All ideas and concerns need to be vindicated and validated. Every voice should be heard in this discussion. So this is a time for planning. It's a time to engage with each other. It's a time to sow the seeds of hope and of optimism. It's a time for nation building. A time for generosity, a time for reaching out the hands of friendship. So, in their I believe we possess the collective wit, the wisdom, and compassion to do all of that and to start democratically planning for self determination, constitutional change, reunification, and national reconciliation. I want to ask you to give a big Donegal welcome to our panel and particularly our chairperson, the former CEO of Udras and Gaeltarte and the former director of Donegal Centre Council, Mihal O'Haney, for my Um I'd like to welcome you now to what is the third meeting of the Commission on the Future of Ireland. Um, this is the Donegal People's Assembly. Um, the meeting is entitled Have Your Say, and this is the event for you in Donegal to have your say. Um, the running order tonight is in your pack, and you'll see that we have a very diverse and experienced panel of contributors um, here on the stage. This is a fully interactive event, and I'll be calling on audience participation throughout the meeting. So um, please do participate. This is your opportunity to make observations, to make comments, to give your views. Comments will be recorded, and there will be a report of the Donegal People's Assembly produced in the coming weeks, which will be emailed to all of the participants here. Um, although Sinn Féin has organized this meeting, I'm an independent um, chairperson of the meeting. I'm being assisted here um, by Rosa McLaughlin, um, which I'm very grateful for. Um, I'm very glad to um, Deputy Pierre Starty for, um, for giving us the context and also for his welcome. Um, I'm aware that we have a very broad attendance here from a diverse range of people from a variety of backgrounds, from business to academia, community development, various sectoral organisations, um, you're all very welcome. I also want to draw your attention to the fact 
that the Commission is still accepting written submissions, and these can be completed um, via the Sinn Féin Party website or by emailing commission at Sinn Féin .ie. To date, there have been over 130 submissions made to the Commission, and they focus on a wide range of themes. People have given their opinions on how public services could be arranged in the New Ireland, how governance structures might work, uh, how partition is affecting them, and how they feel life could be better in a different constitutional framework. Many people believe that now is the time to plan for a new shared future, and that's been coming true um, to the Commission so far. Um, so um, just to introduce our panel of speakers to you, um, first of all, Noelle Duddy. Um, Noelle is a cancer campaigner. She's a former chair of Donegal Action for Cancer and spokesperson for Cooperating for Cancer Care in Northwest. And Noelle is currently a member of can the Cancer Patient Advisory Committee and a member of the Ireland Northern Ireland National Cancer um, in Consortium Implementation Group. Um, next is Seamus Neely. Seamus is former Chief Executive of Donegal County Council. Um, he served as um, CEO of Donegal County Council from 2010 to 2020, and he's also worked in town and county councils in Monaghan and in Cavan, and he's been very involved in various Northwest cross-border um, developments over the years. Um, next, we have, um, we have Terry Scott, Professor Terry Scott, is a non-executive director who's held leadership positions in the education sector, both north and south. Um, she was Pro Vice Chancellor at Ulster University and had a track record of leading change in education and in the public sector while working there and in other organizations. Terry was also president of um, Sligo IT and um, she served on the board of the IDA of Intertrade Ireland, the Grange Government Development Agency, um, of Quell and Enterprise Northern Ireland. Next is Paul Hannigan. Um, Paul is head of college at Atlantic Technological University, Donegal. Paul has an extensive background in higher education and served as president of LYAT from 2008 until he became head of the new ATU Donegal when LYAT was the educated part of the new university. Paul's a former member of the Higher Education Authority and the former director of the Central Applications Office, and he currently serves on the Donegal Local and Community Development Committee. And again, Paul has a very strong track record in working on a cross-border basis, um, forming partnerships and collaborations with educational institutes in, in the North. And um, finally, this is Tony Forrester. Tony's chief executive of Letterkenny Chamber of Commerce, and she has been for the past 14 years um, and over that period, she's worked through a recession, through COVID, and has always striven to ensure that the Chamber makes a relevant contribution to the economic development of the region. And Tony is working on a daily basis with businesses and with various stakeholder organizations. And um, she's very passionate about supporting small business and um, creating an environment for connecting people and beneficial networking. And her stakeholders are all obviously working very much and very influenced very much by the border location um, in the northwest that, that Letterkenny and the rest of Donegal um, is, is subject to. So maybe to start off the discussion, and as I said, we'll be um, putting questions to various panel members, and then we'll be going to you to get your inputs uh, on an ongoing basis. But maybe to start with yourself, Seamus. Um, Seamus, you've been very involved in, um, in being responsible for development of infrastructure, delivery of services in this county, and you've always been very conscious of working in an northwest context. So what, what have been the limitations that maybe you've come across in seeking to get the full potential for this region in terms of infrastructure development, economic development, and so on? Yes, well, thanks, Gerhard, and good evening, everyone. Yeah, I suppose I remind myself of, of the context, as, and we all know where we are, but in terms of, of the scale of the place where our county of Donegal is a little over 160,000 of population, when you look at the mirror, the other half of, of that region on, on the north side, it, it brings us up to in or around the 400,000 people. Um, if you look at the four large urban centres that are that are there, we're in one of them, then Straban, then Derry, then Letterkenny, so it's a relatively small uh, group of urban centres at the centre that, that has 
I suppose, a combined population of about 150, 160,000 people. So it's a very significant region. Um, for all intents and purposes, it looks like one region, yet Mail has asked about the limitations, and there are limitations. There are limitations where, where rules apply. So if you look at the planning of infrastructure, and I suppose in the early days I would have seen that um, infrastructure would be planned in a southern context. There wasn't necessarily um, a thought about how it joined up with uh, what should be the corresponding infrastructure on the other side of, of the separation between the, the, the two counties, or, or the border as, as, as we reference it. Um, if you look at planning policy, for instance, planning policy would have been um, dealt with separately. So county development plan in Donegal been looked at in a Donegal context largely, uh, and, and similarly for the corresponding areas in, in the north. And then, I suppose, if you think about what happens where there are no rules, and what I mean by no rules is that there's nothing preventing people from doing things. So you, you look at what communities do, they interact together, you look at retail, and, and Tony knows plenty of it here, you know, most of the people uh, in, in this neck of the woods shop and, and, and socialise in, in, in the north, and similarly across the border, um, if you go to any of the large employers, uh, if you go to Letterkenny, you're looking at 30-35% of the cars in the car parks, pre-COVID being um, Northern Reg, and if you went to the larger employers in Derry and Strabane, you found the same, where 30, 35, 40 percent of the cars were Southern Red. So the pathways that people and communities were wearing were uh, an integrated approach to doing things. So then, I suppose, what, what we needed to look at then is how could we bring the same sort of approach to try and deal with, with some of those limitations on the infrastructural side. Uh, planning, as you mentioned, the planning of the infrastructure, but you talked about economic development, and again, separate organisations uh, supporting the potential for job growth on either side of the border, and, you know, very often competing with each other, so it's about trying to find uh, the ways of, 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 um, of where there are common areas of interest common areas of purpose and finding ways to work together to make that happen. And, and there is a story around the Northwest City region that, that has seen that evolve over a six or eight year period from 2014-2015 onwards. Yeah. Thanks, James. T Tony, um, uh, Seamus referenced retail there mm -hmm. and um, you're dealing every day with business people, small yeah. business people, people that are affected. Um, what, what do you think the impact is? And I think Seamus is, is right. Uh, businesses and people and community, just get on with it. You know, we just kind of do our business. Um, I suppose we had that whole, we had Brexit, which uh, I suppose I was thinking about today, you know, do people, is, was Brexit at the top of everybody's agenda? Did they talk about it every day? Well, maybe not, but people like us were, and we were all worried about it. But businesses, found, I suppose what they had to do was find a way of working. And that's what that and that's what James is referencing. I suppose, you know, communities find a way of working, and people find a way of working, and, re and business find a way of working. Um, but there are some times when things happen, and rules on either side of the border will change. But I, I suppose my big one of our biggest frustrations is the agencies. You know, we've seen we Northwest Regional Cross Border Group and the councils working together has been absolutely amazing, and you know, really showing what we can do. But it, but the agencies, as Seamus said, you know, they have to be in competition to a certain extent and they have different rules. So it's our businesses definitely um, find a way and will always find a way. Um, they, do, they just don't see obstacles. Um, and, and if there are obstacles, they'll find a way around them. Now, there are certain, there are issues going on at the moment and I suppose um, fisheries and things like that are, are causing problems. Mm. But... Um, most general businesses who were very worried about Brexit at one stage have kind of said, right, I, we'll get on with it. But, and some of the, sometimes they break some rules, I suppose, but um, we don't see, the, I suppose our, our thing is in our heads, we don't see the border. You know, mm. it's, it's there and um, we have to deal with it. Very good, thank you, Tony. Uh, in terms of that, just staying on the cross-border cooperation, I know, Paul, that, um, you know, education is key um, to, you know, the future sustainability of this region. And from your point of view and um, what's your experience been in terms of trying to advance that and to have a sustainable education model for the Northwest? I think, go back a little bit in, in 
<coughs> our development of our relationship, particularly with the University of Ulster and North West Regional College. If you go back around 2007 and the National Development Plan at that stage, there was significant investment plan for the development of cross-border third-level education, particularly mentioning ourselves as Letterkenny IT at the time with the University of Ulster in, in McGee. As you know, the economy fell off a cliff at that stage, and that happened everywhere, worldwide situation. The f political focus disappeared from the border completely, disappeared out of all programmes for government. There was no mention of any cross-border activity at all at that stage in any of the programmes for government that followed that, until we ended up, you know, a number of years back, when we started to get back on track again following the, the recession at the time. So from my perspective on a national level, when you were trying to bring up cross-border issues at the time, people in Cork and Kerry didn't want to know about it. You know, they were all about looking after their own situation and where they found themselves at the time. But we came through that and in 2018 we now signed um, a memorandum of understanding with the University of Ulster where Terry was working. And Terry was working in IT Sligo when we did this at the time, developing the Atlantic Technological University. So we signed the agreement with the University of Ulster, North West Region College and Donegal ETB as well. So we brought together the four actors within this region in terms of both further and higher education. And what we've developed is the Northwest Tertiary Education Cluster, and we're working very closely as a four within that to try and bring things forward. It's never easy. A lot of it is based on personal relationships and how people get on together and work together. We tried to take that out of it and make it about the actions we're involved in and how we move those forward. I think we're making real progress at the moment because we're, started, we're slightly ahead of national policy in terms of tertiary education and what we're trying to achieve there. Um, and we feel we have real opportunities to drive on further and use this development within the Northwest City region that Seamus and my hull were involved as architects in, to use the Northwest City region as an example of what can be done when people actually work together. And I think it was very useful what the context that Piers said at the start, where you're looking at the challenges people have, but actually the opportunities that are there as well. And I think we're all about trying to avail of the opportunities and move them forward. The barriers, sorry, one thing I was going to say just when you're talking about Brexit there, and I should have brought it in the context of what I said a minute ago. Brexit was a positive in one way, and one way only in my view, is that it brought the political focus back on the border. That it had disappeared completely. It was very difficult for us to make any arguments around cross-border engagement or whatever, until Brexit came back on the scene again. And that gave us an opportunity to say, look, we need to look specifically at the border and how we deal with it. And we're trying to take advantage of that, and we'll continue to take advantage of it to make it work. There are barriers, there are problems. We've had funded projects where the money comes to Letterkenny, or to ATU Donegal. We want to give money to Northwest Regional College or University of Ulster in terms of move things forward. But I, I did it once and I got my hands slapped very badly. <laughs> I needed a further agreement in order to do that, so we had to go back and draft another agreement to make sure that worked. But simple things like that that you wouldn't think of normally, just you know, barriers and then working back to back at times has always been an issue. But I think we're making real progress at the moment and I think they're real opportunities. And it's great to have this discussion this evening to try and move things forward even a bit further. Thanks very much, Paul. Just, Terry, you've seen this from both sides of the border. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to add anything to what Paul has said there? Yeah, when the National Higher Education Strategy was uh, announced, Paul, was in 2011, yeah. and, you know, at that time there was a vision set for a new type of institution. And I know it's, it's small in the context of, you know, all island developments, but, you know, there was a vision for a new higher education institution, which in order to be a new institution, you had to merge. And that meant that there had to be compromise. There was all sorts of discussions and we were just having a conversation there and reminiscing about Athlone and Dundalk and all the different permutations that we looked at about a border university, about a Midlands border and West University. And always we had the idea of the, you know, and when we said like we we're going to take three of the four largest uh, sort of remote counties in Ireland and you're going to establish a university. Now it took a little bit longer than we initially anticipated but the fact that you've got Atlantic Technological University with, you've got St Angeles and Sligo, you've got GMIT, you've got Castlebar, you know, you've got nine campuses across the, the counties and that is such a game changer because the one thing that is changing is access to education and opportunity. So the two things are, are two sides of the one coin. So if you've got access to education, whether it's apprenticeships, whether it's trades, whether it's further education, and the, now the access to further education and the progress into higher education is the big game changer. Because we have got the skills in this region that are the envy. Look at the announcements in the last two weeks in, with FinTech. If you said that 10 years ago, they would have said, what tech? 
right? FinTech, there's 200 jobs in Letterkenny, it's been 300 more for Derry. And I think that is demonstrating that we can attract talent, but importantly, we can retain and bring people back. And I'm so delighted that the contributor uh, from the floor mentioned the importance of climate, because that is one thing that, you know, health, quality of life is important, but the world has changed and the pandemic and the climate crisis have changed, have upped the gear. And that is the one thing that as a grandparent myself, a very recent grandparent, and I'm looking at this, our you know, three month old Fia and saying, what responsibility we have as citizens for the next generation. So access to skills, access to opportunity, but remember the Ireland that we are leaving to the next generation is an island on the planet. And the whole importance and the responsibility of nature-based solutions to what we do in terms of replacing, retaining, preparing. And you mentioned business models there, Michal. Uh, the type of business models that we use, whether it's for higher education, whether it's for business. We've got fantastic businesses in this part of the world. You know, look what E&I Engineering and Comparative have done in, in Burnfoot, what Philip O'Doherty and his team have done there. That is amazing, and that is making people stand up and listen and look at the success. And you know, KNN Networks, Primerica, Optum, what is happening in Donegal and in the border region is now the envy of the rest of the island. And I think we need to take that optimism. I agree entirely with the opening remarks, Pierce, in terms of some of the disadvantage. But People are resilient. We're agile and we're adaptable. And let's not lose sense of that adventure and that opportunity because if we look at the future being, you know, up, and I'm not being naive, but we do need to embrace that resilience and that strength and that adventure that has got us to where we are today. Thank you, Terry. I know that the issue of health has come up in, um, been mentioned by some speakers, and um, we're very glad to have Noel with us here. So in terms of health, it's something that affects us all. And what's your experience of the situation um, in the Northwest with the border um, coming straight down to our hinterland? Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks very much for, for Sinn Féin for inviting me to be here this evening and with the panel to discuss this very exciting issue and very exciting discussions. Um, as, a, as a northerner um, and as a child, um, we kind of thought that Donegal was very lucky because it was partitioned outside of uh, the <laughs> north. Um, we went to Donegal for our holidays and we got away from it. We had peace and quiet and possibly developed a very romantic notion of what Donegal was as opposed to the reality of what it was. Um, and didn't appreciate maybe, and maybe a lot of Northerners don't appreciate just what rural life is in Donegal and what partition has actually meant for Donegal. And when we came to live here, it was all very idyllic and all very innocent to us until I got a diagnosis of cancer and realised, you know, I had to travel to Dublin. I wasn't going to Belfast anymore and I had to travel to Dublin and I had a young family and I realised that, that, you know, this isn't... This shouldn't be the case, you know, and I appreciate that people from Derry were um, uh, having to go to Belfast as well for their treatment, but Belfast and Derry just seemed to be closer to me in my mind, maybe because I was more familiar with it and familiar with the healthcare system. But um, I couldn't get one, you talked about, was it Seamus McBride there, talked about, you know, equality, and equality is about everybody and about everything that a nation should be built upon. Um, and I realised I could go if I had the money to pay for a mammogram. I could have got my mammogram and beat the, the, the healthcare system and got into the system quicker. But I didn't have healthcare insurance and I had to wait. And I remember sitting on a uh, beside a woman and she said, you had to wait for your mammogram. And I said, oh God, you know, months. And she said, oh gosh, you mustn't have health insurance. Um, I, I got mine, I phoned up to ask for a mammogram and I was asked what day, you know, and that struck me. Um, I, was, I had a diagnosis of cancer and uh, I realised that having to travel this distance was just for ordinary cancer treatment was not, wasn't on. So we, we, um, we 
decided we had to do something. And the, the common sense approach to me, a long story short, was that we had to look at the Northwest region. And at the time of my diagnosis in 2005, there was talk about developing radiotherapy services. And I thought, we have to have radiotherapy services in the Northwest, not traveling down to Dublin and not traveling. Galway wasn't even in the picture. And what happened there was that a group called uh, Corporate for Cancer Care Northwest, we decided we'll go to the north and we'll go to the southern governments and we'll turn around and say, how can you help us? We've got a wish list. And what partition demonstrated to me was that Donegal had a population of 160,000 thereabouts and it didn't have the critical mass to have a radiotherapy unit. And we all know and understand the difficulties that we have now of recruiting and retaining uh, uh, professionals and others in our healthcare system. And so we went and we spoke, and I had a very interesting uh, meeting on a plane, uh, when, when there was a plane leaving from Derry going to Dublin. And it was with William Hay, who somebody, somehow, managed to sit him beside me. And he was going down to meet with the speaker in the, in, uh, in the door. I thought, take your opportunity. Um, we need a cross-border radiotherapy on it. We need to have it at Nat and Galvin, or we need to have it in Letterkenny. But we can't have it in both because we need a critical mass population. We have to join both sides of the border together to get this critical mass so that we have got the 400, 400 500 of a population. And William Hay from the DUP, Speaker of the House, turned around and said, give me your email address. Because I wanted to meet, and our group wanted to meet with Minister Majimsey, who was the, the health minister then. I'm sorry, I have to the health minister, Minister Majims, or uh, pardon me, William Hay arranged that meeting. And in the beginning of 2008, we met Minister Majimsey with our wish list. Said, "What are we going to do here? This is about. This isn't about cross border. This is about developing infrastructure for a people that need a treatment in a region. It's not about green. It's not about orange. It's about people having cancer." And it's about making that happen. Now, Minister Majimsey, he went on, he organised a meeting with us to, to see the cancer centre in Belfast. We were very well received by the unionist community. Now, I'm not naive, just as you said, there's a whole lot of politics being played by everybody. But at the end of the day, that unit in Alton Galvin is working for radiotherapy service for the people of Donegal. The Irish government contributed 20, 000, 20 million into the infrastructure of that unit in Alt McGelvin. We have got access to that, but it's not enough because we were having a discussion earlier about Donegal being unique. It's always called unique, and we also had a discussion about sometimes unique can mean the opposite to what you think. Unique can mean special, which Donegal is, but unique can also mean different, long finger, problem, and that everything in Donegal is put on the long finger, the A5, a cancer centre to serve the North West because people in Donegal still have to travel on the long finger 300 kilometres from my house to Galway to get certain cancer treatments and it's not good enough. But what we do need to do is develop the infrastructure, develop the will within people, work to people's strengths. And what we find was that people were willing to, when you sat down and round the table, people were willing to listen. and. There was a trust being built up. And again, not be naive as to what that is, because Derry has now got a beautiful cancer centre. But in Donegal, we still only have partial of that, that very sophisticated access. And in Donegal, we're still travelling to Galway, we're still travelling to Dublin, we're still going to Letterkenny. And what we need is a shared partnership of collaboration and we have to start building on that because it's in doing that that you're eroding this differences between who who are we north and south of the border and I believe that the cross-border radiotherapy unit has opened doors and avenues and demonstrated that this can be done so it's talking it's trusting it's been open it's been honest it's been innovative and it's turning around and saying, we will aspire to the, ide the ideal. And it might take us a while to get there. We might never get there. But we will definitely improve the development of healthcare within this region. Thank you very much. Um, some other inputs here? Is there somebody trying to... Hello. 
Uh, my name is Paul Kern and I'm with the Intercultural Platform. I'm here with my colleague Mohammed. Um, I just wanted to mention and maybe echo a few words that have been uh, spoken about by, uh, in the introduction and by the panel. Um, and that's, I suppose, it's community, it's participation, and it's diversity. Uh, and our organisation is very much focused on those uh, issues in terms of Donegal. Uh, and and um, Noel just mentioned that word equality as well. And maybe I would add the word equity to that uh, concept as well. In relation to um, community, I suppose one of the things we would be very strong about would be uh, and it's been acknowledged that communities do things in a very flexible and in a very responsive and a very imaginative and creative way. Um, and sometimes that's by necessity. Our view would very much be that, that uh, there's a, a, you referred in terms of health to a, a health subsidiarity about making decisions close to where the needs are and looking at, at uh, a critical mass of need. We would very much be of the opinion that um, there, are many, uh, there are many communities. There's not just communities of geography. There's communities of interest, there's oh. communities of diversity, there's communities of faith, um, and that really uh, looking at how community organisations and community development approaches bring a very innovative way uh, of bringing communities together in a positive way. I also think in the current situation, um, and, and I know uh, Pierce mentioned new communities, that there is a challenge around uh, the perception of diversity as being a threat, that diversity is in fact uh, an opportunity uh, not just for Donegal, but for Ireland. But there's a responsibility we feel attaching to that to protect uh, the rights, the equality, uh, and the opportunity of people who've come newly to our community, uh, but also people who've been here uh, for generations. Um, you don't simply have to be, I mean, Phil Linnett, uh, can't remember the other footballer, but there's lots of people who are from the black, uh, black heritage who are, we receive and recognize as Irish. There's many other people here Irish. We've travellers, we've Roma, live in this community for generations. They are part of our community as well. So that diversity and that uh, imaginative approach that community approaches bring, I think should be really important and part of this. The last thing I would just say about participation is that um, there are many different ways to look at the democratic process and people have uh, raised questions about politicians. And I'm often reluctant to criticize politicians, but I would certainly say the political system that we have should really more effectively reflect participative democracy, where people like this, like us in this room, get a chance to think about, talk about, reflect, comment, criticize, contribute. And I think that's maybe a, uh, something we could bring to, to the, the, this commission's work, to look at uh, imaginative uh, political methods, political structures, community structures that actually make this a richer and more participative society, and address some of the issues that were spoken about today. I don't know if Mohammed wants to say anything. No. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Is, are there any other comments? I think we have one up here, please. Uh, I have no suggestion. I would like to just end with the panel there who have kind of illustrated to us in their own respective fees how, despite trying to show them against the tide, they have tried to address you know, the cross-border cooperation to respect the phase. There's a lot of probably resistance a lot of the time. But it just kind of shows the potential that is there if there was an integrated approach uh, in terms of policy and in terms of if there was uh, a people's assembly whereby we could look at the, the different areas of policy and start to apply um, from the agreement about how, what a new Ireland would look like. For me, it is no coincidence that one of the first things that the UK stopped going to was the North-South the Rail Council. Why? It's because they probably see the potential, the embryonic potential, embryonic potential of where this could go. Before they left the Assembly, they stopped attending the, 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 the Rail meetings on the South basis. And I'm sure the panel will say that progress is actually stalled in a lot of areas, across a lot of sectors because of that. Uh, the Irish government, for its part, has made no effort to bridge that gap between that loss of the North-South Ministerial Council by actually progressing that North-South agenda in each any, any shape or fashion. So I think it makes the need for a People's Assembly all the more present, because that vacuum is, is now there. 
How are we going to ever see the potential that, that well, the cancer centre, the sparing unit, and the good facilities are there without people coming, like uh, I've seen guests coming there, uh, well, Dolly, sorry, without the well and people like them. Uh, by Jumsey. He stalled it for a long time and there was a lot of resistance from the last time we saw that cancer centre. Uh, but I think that's incumbent upon the Irish government uh, and they get off the hook and they, 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 they continue to make excuses and they, they, they fire out a red hair. We, don't, we can't have a border poll tomorrow morning. We're not looking for a border poll tomorrow morning. We're looking for them to start the discussion and start to talk about what a new Ireland looks like and start to put a uh, uh, man to say anything. People will be saying that we get over because we're supposed to say this, but everybody is huge and take it on board and stop stalling our future. Thank you, Commander. Um, um, Sorry, Tony. There was something mentioned about, you know, we, we know that infrastructure is an issue here and it's a big topic for us, I have to say, in the Chamber. Um, and there's, there's been a deficit for many, many years. But I was just listening to the, the co comments there. I think the conversation has changed a little bit over the last while. When the national, last National Development Plan came out, you know, the Northwest City region, we were put there. You know, it was, and I think there was a lot of fighting to get us in there, but it was there. And that, I think, helps us have a conversation, a slightly different conversation. We say we, we have won our place. We know the Northwest region works because we're having the conversations about it. We're not necessarily waiting necessarily on, co on politicians to do it for us. And, and we're moving forward with education and, and business and hopefully health as well. So I just wanted to say that because I feel sometimes that, you know, it's, it's like we don't do anything about it. But we're, we're always pushing um, back into government to say we're, we're here and we're doing it well. But the other point I wanted to make was I grew up in Northern Ireland, I still live in Northern Ireland, and I, uh, sometimes the conversation or the sort of um, the community and people get on with things better because of what Noel said, trust and doggedness to a certain extent, we just get on with it. And I, I remember when, um, 25 years ago now, I can't believe it, um, with the Good Friday Agreement, you know, sometimes we felt as a community that we were way ahead you know, and we were waiting for people to catch up with us. And I think, I suppose as I've got older, I realise, well, you know what, we have to keep on having those conversations and keep moving ahead. And, and, and if politics need to catch up, they will. I do believe, mind you, that the Irish government, like they did with Brexit, they put a load of... Um, each department started working on what, what would this look like, what would... Um, you, know, you know, now we're a united Ireland, what would it look like, and put things in place. And... I think we have to push that back to them as well to say, start putting things in place. My benefits, I, I only see benefits really, and only see opportunities, if mm -hmm. I'm very honest with um, a, an Ireland that's, that works together. Um, we've been, the border's been there too, lo too long for us. Great, thanks, Tony. <laughs> um, just before we go back to the audience, I know Seamus, um, you've been very proactive working closely with Derry and Strabane Council um, over the years in promoting the Northwest as one region with yeah. that critical mass and that's what you take out to the rest of Ireland, that's what you take out to the rest of the world and um, I mean how much easier would that be without the border? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I suppose I mentioned some of the barriers when, when I last spoke and I, I'm, I'm thinking in particular of the work of the two councils, Donegal County Council, Derry City and Strabane District Council, I'm conscious that there are members in, in the audience that have um, played an active role in making that happen. So things that they've done um, effectively as pathfinders, so they, they rely on the fact that they both have um, community planning feeding into their systems. Uh, that, that's similar, both sides of the border since, since 2014. Uh, so that captures all of the, the sectoral inputs you know, from right across the, the industrial sector pieces, the, the unions, the community and voluntary. So there's an understanding of what's happening on the ground. There's an understanding of what's needed. There, there, is, there is messages and instructions that come out of those fora that then feed into both councils. But what both councils done was that they looked at the common issues, they looked at the common, common challenges they had, but always through the lens of where's the, where's the opportunity? Because what they wanted to do was to 
changed the narrative, and the narrative was that the North West is a place that needs a lot of support. It needs a lot of social contribution, so more people unemployed, more unemployment benefit, more this, more that. And the narrative that the councils wanted to change was turn that around, change, put a little bit of, of investment in up front, cause things to happen, move people away from being unemployed to being employed so there's a contribution. And actually, one of the questions that, 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 that uh, uh, Deputy Doherty was asking at the start is how can you afford these things? So if you turn it around, what would be um, a dependent community becomes an enabling community. But uh, the, the fundamental point was that the, the, f the found areas of common interest across the two council areas, they had a cross-border group, and both councils effectively delegated responsibility and authority to make those things happen under their watch. And, you know, those are the things that, that can happen when you, when you um, I suppose, I wouldn't say ignore the fact that the border is there, but look at it, look at all of the things that you can do together uh, notwithstanding the fact that the border is there and so much progress has been made in that. So I think those are the, the sort of stuff that you begin to look then at, at planning on a back-to-back, -back, not on a back-to-back -back isolated way, but collectively. So you look at, you know, you, t you talk more practically about your county development and city development plan rather than technically about it. You understand what feeds into it because you've listened to the community, you've listened to the voluntary sector, you've listened to the, to the uh, various community pillars, uh, and so you bring that all to the table and, and you collectively make it happen so you have something then that doesn't just technically work but it practically works as well. And I think that can be replicated right across the board. You then have opportunities to put proposals in front of governments to say, our people have put those together, our councils have decided this. If you give us the money to invest in that infrastructure, here are the benefits that can come from it. And there have been I suppose notable examples of that already. So that's just an example of how it can happen here, Lydia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I suppose just going back to some of the remarks made earlier, I worked in Dundalk for 10 years as well, so I have a fair idea of the way the border and cross-border activity works in that space. And it's quite obvious to me that the level of activity over here and the level of engagement and the level of cooperation is far away ahead of where it is over there at the moment. And, and you know, I've, I'm out of there 25 years, but I don't think it's changed that much that I can see. Um, and I think it's, you know, great credit to everybody here, the way things have worked. Also, going back to one of the comments there, we've been brought, we're being asked to go in front of the Northside Ministerial Council two weeks from today to talk about skills and education on a cross-border basis. So all the partners are going to meet the Northside Ministerial Council with the representatives of the two councils here in, in this region. So that's initiated from there again. And it's real positive in terms of that engagement. And also next week, I'm in front of a Doyle committee talking about student mobility, north and south, and the barriers to that, and how that's been trying to address as well. I know uh, Deputy Conway Walsh has been the leader in terms of bringing that paper through the, the Doyle at the moment. So we're responding to a paper that's been brought forward by herself. So there's, there's quite a bit of movement and activity, as uh, Tony has said, and it's keeping that momentum going to make sure you know, that the outcomes are better. You know, when we were going through the Atlantic Technological University process, then we were asked, you know, what's going to be different? It has to be different and it has to be better. And that's the same with, the, with uh, things move on in terms of the border moving away. It has to be different and it has to be better. And I think when people can buy into that and can see something more positive coming down the line, it will be a positive outcome for everybody. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Just on that, I know that there are people here from a lot of different sectors, from a lot of different um, economic sectors and interest groups. Just in terms of that question about the potential benefits of Irish unity for the region, would we have any inputs, any, any comments from the floor on that? Uh, my name is Eo Donnell. I'm here on behalf of the fishing community. I represent fishing vessels coastwide. I think we're, just to speak about the economic piece, which is very important to Donegal, because Donegal is the capital of seafood in Ireland. 62% of all the volume of fish landed into this country comes into Donegal. But we have a number of challenges. The challenges are bureaucratic, some of them. The challenges relate to Brexit. The challenges relate to how we're perceived in Europe. And uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, after Brexit, we transferred 40% of the value of our small quotas from Ireland to the 40% of the total transfer from Ireland to the UK. 
So the rest, the other EU members carried the rest of it, which meant that we were hit disproportionately. So we have an issue of resilience. We have a great future, but we have to go out there and fight for it. And I have to give full credit here. I know there's a lot of criticism of politicians. But in my experience, if you get your message right, if you're coherent in what you're saying, if you, if you uni unite with some of your colleagues, the politicians will stand behind you, both nationally and internationally at MEP level. I have to give credit here to Deputy McLaughlin, to Chris McManus, the likes of Colin, Marlar Colin Markey, people like this who have gone the extra mile to represent our sector at a time when official Ireland doesn't really support us at all. To put it in perspective, Ireland has export sales of seafood of less than 600 million. We have a population of 5 million people. The Norwegians, who are not a member of the EU, have exports 25 times our level. They're over 14 billion. So we have a massive opportunity there. We have been on an all-Ireland basis dealing with Northern Ireland since the mid-70s. We've had very good close relationships with them. We've sourced raw material from them. We've collaborated with them. But now we have an additional layer of bureaucracy in terms of paperwork. If you've got a vessel in Northern Ireland that wants to land into Donegal, he can only land from Monday until Friday evening, which doesn't make sense in the seafood sector. This is an Irish problem. This was imposed by Irish bureaucracy. So we've got to get over this mindset. We've got to get more ambition back into the sector. We are being let down by some of our public servants who don't believe in us and who have overseen the decline of the sector over the last 20 or 30 years. So I think we have a great future, but we've got to fight for it, we've got to unite, and we do have to work with our politicians to get to where we want to be. Well, first of all, I, I would like to thanks for the opportunity to speak. In relation to the Commission, I think it's, it's a great idea because we, we all know the problem with Brexit was there was a vote that people didn't know what they were voting on. And if it comes to a stage of voting on United Ireland uh, or a border poll, we have to know what we're voting on and people have to know what they're voting on. Um, one thing I, I think for certain is that if we don't sort the, um, the, the health system out, it'll be very hard to, to, to win a vote because um, the health system just needs major reform. It's, it's, it's a huge issue. Um, a couple of other things. I, I, I suppose, um, speaking, I, I come from, I, I, before, in a previous life, I, I owned a fishing vessel and I, I, I come from the fishing industry. Um, and, like, you know, the bottom line is that when we had six, we were 16% of the fish uh, in European waters when we joined the European Union, we were allowed to catch. Um, 4.6%, 2.3% um, by value. Um, so we effectively have given away our fishing rights. We're in a position now where, especially when you look at the energy situation in Europe, and you look at we have, you know, with all our problems, we have a stable political system and we have a stable energy source in the wind. Donegal is in the best position in the world in relation to wind and relation to proximity of market. We have Derry beside us, where we have, going up to Sligo, it's a 110 volt line, which is maxed out. We have a 330 or 360 volt, I'm not sure which it is, in, in Derry anyway, but it, we should be able to link directly into that. And more importantly, we make, must make sure not to give it away. We give away our fishing rights. In Dublin, we give away to bulger funds, we give the future of our youth and they're paying exorbitant rates because of it. And now we have an opportunity where communities and communities, especially in Donegal and areas off the West Coast, have a natural resource that is far better than Norway's because this is a resource that can last forever. It's not just oil that'll last for 40 or 50 years, it's a resource that'll last forever. And my big fear is that we'll do what we have done in the past, we'll give it away, and that we need to be very, very careful that we don't do that, and we need to be careful that the, the local communities benefit from it. I just want to give an example. If you're living in Tory Island and you haven't got a fishing quota because the quota's been taken off you and the wind is blowing over you and you're getting nothing out of the fishing, 
You're getting nothing out of, out of the wind. You're getting nothing out of the resources you have. Yet, we're all part of the European Union, and a regional policy is one of the pillars of the Treaty of Rome. So we have the pillar, which is a regional policy, being dictated by lesser policies, which would include fisheries policies and, and other policies. We need to get our house in order. We, f we do need to sort the, the, the north out and the links with the, with the north out, but we need to get our own houses in order first. And um, in Donegal, we, we have to make sure that the resources that we have, which are bountiful and plentiful, that we get the best out of it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, Lorraine. I'm aware that I'm sandwiched in between two fishing pitches here, but I'm going to talk about young people. And I don't want to say I'm representing young people because obviously I'm not that young anymore. <laughs> and there's plenty of young people either side of me here. But um, I work with Donegal Youth Service. And I think I've been there maybe 25 years at this stage. And I've been there since the start of the Peace and Reconciliation Fund. So the SEUPB, the Special EU Programs Body Fund towards Peace and Reconciliation. And as an organization, we have had um, a lot of resources um, from that fund. And we've continued to pursue that fund every time it comes because it bolsters the money for youth services along the border counties and in Northern Ireland. And we've used that as an opportunity to bring young people together, both North and South. And in the early days, we were allowed to just do uh, general youth work. It was fantastic. And then they came along and they said, actually, you have to focus on the peace and reconciliation piece. And it was a real challenge for us to get young people from Donegal, um, in our case, interested in the border and politics in Northern Ireland and what did that mean? And that was a challenge, but what we came to realize was once we got young people together to talk about their common issues, the things that mattered to them, it was easy. It was easy to get them in the room and talk about things like education, um, like their interests, like um, infrastructure, services they had or didn't have, how much it cost to go to the doctor or didn't cost, all of those things that were shared for them. And for us within the youth sector, we met with our counterparts to have shared learning events, to share practice, to see how we could make our services better for the young people. Because at the end of the day, we just wanted to get them the best deal possible. And if that meant coming together, and our last um, large scale project was around mental health. And obviously we navigated that through the pandemic. And um, I know Pierce touched on this earlier on. We talked about you know, health and the impact of mental health um, and the legacy of the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, that, that tranche of funding is now coming to an end. So we um, have to then apply for the next part. But that's just the nature of how it goes. I guess what I'm trying to say is we, we do the best with what we have within the community and voluntary sector. Um, I could go on at length around the impact of cuts um, and, and, and how we're constantly you know, turning the next stone and rock over to find out where there's funding. But we do it because we know that there's opportunities for young people that, that wouldn't normally get them other, other, other ways. We know that young people's voices are not heard in the way they should be. And we want to make sure that we can put a spotlight on those gaps um, to make sure that young people from Donegal especially are heard because sometimes it feels like we're just so far away from Dublin um, that, that the services are not brought up to the area. And I know there's been a lot said on that so far. But I will say that when it comes to um, working together, but like what Tony was saying, um, we find a way and we try and make it work and we try to get young people the best deal possible, whether it's going into Northern Ireland and to Southwest College or into the different um, education provisions that they have them there to get the course that they can't access here, or if it's working with the ETB or the ATU, that's what we have to do to make it work. And I think that's, that's where the beauty is. Um, and um, no offence to politicians, it's not in politics because the people on the ground just get on with it. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lorraine. Um, Edna. Ethan McLaughlin, shot to go for his and kill out in the Crush Valley. Um, just pile him lance and I look at the Rory Shumsu 
Andrew, the Cantonese Luhia, talking about the resources, natural resources, and to follow on. And I suppose one of the things that we have to look at is community. And we've, it's been touched on by everyone here about the survival of our community and our youth. We have the issue there of, um, of the retrofitting that's going on at the moment in order to hit our climate change action targets, which is is failing so it is at the moment. I don't know what, how we're ever going to meet those. There's a shortage of plumbers, there's a shortage of of these people to go and work in the retrofit uh, in that whole area of the renewable energies. Third level definitely needs to do something in looking in that. Uh, if you take that on to the next level then of looking at as a survival strategy for communities, of looking at the wind and looking at uh, those resources and without sitting where we're sitting mentioning wind turbines or solar farms. Um, we need the whole national grid upgraded so we do. We're looking at uh, the situation at the moment that 1% of our green energy is allowed to be um, generated by um, community groups and yet in a community group goes together, fulfills all that and has to go to auction. The, uh, the, if there isn't a substation available to the local community where they've been hit with that, been able to raise, to generate their own power, raise their own income, they've been hit so they are with the length of the distance of the cost that it takes to put in the line into the into the um, into the substation so there's definitely something that needs to be there in policy there to rec to 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 look at communities and how that can be um, offset in some way for voluntary work in that the other element there is the whole area of upgrades now look we know the policy at the moment the policy is doing x houses uh, up until recently, they were allowed to do the X houses nationally. It didn't matter where they were done. And obviously, because of the, um, the housing stock in urban areas, um, Dublin, all the major cities were all been, are much more the difference between uh, the housing stock that are different levels on BER rating is huge disparity between inner city and rural area. Rural area housing stock are one off, much, much more expensive to do. There needs to be some kind of policy where that can be set off against a uh, mortgage, can be tied into mortgages. Um, people who are, own their own houses definitely will look at that, um, as a, a, even in the whole, being able to move it on to the next generation. So there's a whole issue there in rural, in rural regeneration, in rural upgrading and retrofitting of housing that needs to be addressed. But I think are one of the things that the third level institutes have spoken to tonight that we're dealing with down in Cullot is we're actually working hand in hand with third level, uh, third level institutes um, and we're working with, uh, with AATU, with UCD, um, we have um, a department on board in the whole area of research of food sustainability, soil management uh, and looking at that all within uh, in, in the actions, climate change actions and I think that it's, it's uh, until the third levels come out and use communities and recognise communities as a very rich resource and hands on they, they, we transfer the, the rhetoric and the theory into reality and to move that on, I think that there's a huge opportunity there that really needs to go into policy or does rather than, than community groups working in common cap in hand because you know some community people do not do cap in hand very graciously and wonder why they should have to. Uh, so I think that the whole area of the of the natural resources, of the wind has been spoken about. Few and few and last eat in Changi, August in the Fedget on last eat in Changi, Kahi, much onk, Yerushtar and tree level, August Shinnah or rubber or Wahilish and the Hindulati Augustna Norugiana Mudge a a gossel on a Kenya hate Kenya August just punch you on Elita Rach and Chardini Kancher last eat and lot Plichetta. We don't want to bash our politicians too 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 much, but I think that the time to put the politicians from the north and the south. I think a lot of the problems in here is maybe wider than the politicians in the north and the south. I think we're going to junk to us and the Fadika Foster, because we're going to and Rodi Tatarlu last evening for do the na Rodi Aharli and Snam and Snam who heart because the nearest to town is in the Harli and our feet hush Snam to the heart. Grumaiga. Just, um, just arising from the discussions we've had about obstacles and about um, um, opportunities, and I think that people do see um, the, the opportunities that are there if there wasn't a border. Um, the whole thing about safeguarding socioeconomic rights and safeguarding identities were 
people to be looking towards United Ireland. Terry, maybe we, you, you might want to come in on that just to, to start us off. Yeah, I think the, the conversation there came round to the importance of valuing the diversity, you know, the different ethnic makeup that we have in our country today is very different than it was 25 years ago. And so the demographics was in and referred earlier to job announcements. Those announcements are made on an economic and in business terms. And it is really, really important that we value the, the journey of education through to enterprise, employment, and that people feel connected to the community. And one of the things that is, is really important is, you, know, you, you talked there, I think it was Anne, yeah, the, about the, uh, the importance of bringing young people across community. I grew up in Derry. Uh, I was fortunate enough that I was thrown out on a cross-country track or into a swim pool or uh, there, there wasn't a camogie pitch back in the day. You know, I tried my hand at it later on. But you know, one of the things was, as a, as a youngster growing up, uh, I was the length and breadth of the country. And it didn't matter what community you were from because you were running a race, you were on a cross-country track, you were on a uh, you were looking, you were going to places that had tartan tracks, whether it was down to Belfield or whatever. And one of the things that that gives you as a young person is an aspiration and seeing something that's a little bit further. And the conversation needs to be on a unity of purpose. So if you want to win the cup as a football team, then you don't just start off in the third division and win the cup. You have to get into the second division, you have to get into the first division. And I think that's one of the things that we have the ability to do with bringing young people together, is having a unity of purpose, having a common purpose. And one of those common purpose is certainly, and if we listen to young people and engage with them, is the importance of the environment and the importance issues relating to climate change. But all of the young people that live and work, or live in this area, have an aspiration, maybe to travel. We want them to be connected to this place, and we want them to come back. And if you look at, you know, I'm, my background's in regional development and, and education, and one thing that I'm, I'm passionate about is giving people a sense of place. And one of the things that we can do, if you bring businesses together, you bring education institutions together, whether it's within the county, whether it's from Kerry to Derry or Cork and Kerry, you know, one of the things, if you get a commitment that you're going to do something and people will stand, whether it's a political mandate or whether it's a community mandate to say, I am going to do something, you will find that what gets measured gets done. And the community will hold you to account. So I think that is something that is, we could set our sights on in terms of what we believe that we want, to, what we understand is possible, because taking small steps in terms of being inclusive, having the equity agenda, having opportunities for education and progression, and you take it back to the analogy of the, the you know, running the race or winning the team, you do a little bit each time. You're not going to get there overnight. And just, I want to pick up on the, you talked about the access to education. We now have a medical school in the region, and that was possible because of work of at ground, at grassroots level, cancer campaigners, because you can't have a medical school without staff. You know, you, some people will be aware of the difficulties in Southwest, you know, trying to retain surgical services. One of the answers there will be looking at you know, what you do with Sligo and Enniskillen. You, know, you have to look at re, uh, sparsely populated in the context of a six million population, you have to see where you can bring scale. And I think one of the opportunities for us in this region, say we've got a medical school, one of the opportunities will be going forward. Can we educate the doctor? Agree, because certain, you know, that's opened up opportunities and careers for people who decided that they have the ambition to be doctors, to come back and to study in Derry. And they can work in either of the health services. And I think that's something that's really important. And that's just one example. But there's 76 doctors there now. We could have 276. And we have the research infrastructure. And we have, and the important thing is, you need to have the quality of the administration services. You need to have the quality of people to work all across the health services. I've just mentioned doctors, but you know, we need to be training people to deal with those public services. Thanks very much, Terry. Thank you.
Just um, maybe to go to the audience now, uh, there's been a, a, a big focus on the need for inclusion and the need for um, participation and um, the diversity, to value the diversity of, um, of our communities. Um, you, you know, are there any views on how um, the rights, the cultural identities of people that would be invited to participate in the New Ireland could be guaranteed? Yeah, I'm, here, I'm here representing the West uh, Ulster Railway Initiative. And um, we were looking at uh, what we're trying to do is get a railway back in Donegal and West Ulster. Sorry. And it's all about linking people to services and for the communities to feel of a better transport system. And all of what I've listened to tonight is all part of that, is having the proper infrastructure in place for the people to be linked together. So we've been working on since the last few years and from last year when we submitted the, our own ambitions of getting the railway back in Donegal. And we're glad now to say that they're looking at Letter Kinney to Derry, but we also like to see the Western Corridor linked up to Letter Kinney as well. And not just Larry Kinney, but other towns and villages and coastal communities in Donegal, plus the, as I say, the islands as well, would actually help to build up our communities again. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Margaret? We can have 76 medical students in Letterkenny at the minute, but like 276, we don't have that kind of accommodation at the moment, like, and it's very, very slow in um, coming forward, you know. I would certainly agree, and uh, it's actually we've created a real problem for ourselves because if you look at other countries where higher education accommodation, and Paul and I were just talking about this last week, uh, the solution to accommodation in, in Germany and Scandinavia and the United States is when young people go to college, go to university, part of that experience is being in a shared dorm, having a facility. I'm sure you've come across that yourself. And we've created this expectation and cost for ourselves as a society is that everybody you know, expects to have an ensuite room. The cost of accommodation in Dublin is now absolutely prohibitive. It's becoming like that. It's the same issues with crisis situation in, in Galway and in other cities. And it's not going to be long before that's right across that students will have to uh, withhold a place at university because they, they simply cannot afford the cost of accommodation. And one of those solutions, and uh, I mentioned I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the board of Grange Gorman, uh, you know, it's a huge issue in terms of uh, accommodation and bringing the, the Dublin Technological University onto one site. Uh, students said, you know, we have world-class education, but the problem is that it is going to be prohibitive because of the cost. And part of that solution could well be you know, looking at a new business model. And that's one of the things that you know, everybody has a responsibility to do. So, you know, and the conversation is, you know, where will your children study? Where will your uh, siblings and your family members study? And you know, we do want people to stay in Donegal. We want if they have the opportunity, we want them to be able to go to, to other cities, we want them to travel internationally. But I think there's a bigger conversation in terms of what do we mean by accommodation and what are the expectations, because the cost currently has now become prohibitive. And uh, I've met, my daughter went to, to, was fortunate enough to go off to the States for a year when she was at university. Um, part of that whole experience was who would she be allocated a, a dorm with? And it's almost like, uh, I presume it's the, the universities use very sophisticated matching uh, the, the, the way, way they do, you know, to make sure that they have you know, young people that can work together, that will be able to be accommodate each other within a shared space. And I think we now have, you know, with digitization, we have the technology to be able to maybe think differently on that. And if we have accommodation for students during term time and then use it for other purposes during holiday times, that can really be a game changer in this part of the world.
And we can see, we've seen that happen in Sligo, we see it happen in, in, in Letterkenny as well. I think we were, talk, we were talking earlier on about the voice of the young people being heard in this discussion, and RA to you, Donegal, Student Union Executive, we're here on mass, all of them are here. And these three guys deal with the accommodation issue on a daily basis, and I've seen them, you know, sitting in front of, you know, lists of people trying to accommodate them and summertime trying to make sure that people have somewhere to stay and the work that these guys have done to try and create opportunities for other people has been outstanding really in terms of with very little help i have to say from ourselves in terms of what we can do to try and make it better for them but they've done the work and they've tried to make it happen and they're also role models in terms of diversity and inclusion in terms of the student body and that extends outside the campus walls then out to the community and what you were talking about earlier on in terms of how communities are engaged in the in the broader community and the acceptance and the tolerance and you know building up those sort of values that are there and i think that's really strong so i just wanted to pay tribute to our own student union executive and the work that they do hello Minorities are across the ten grounds of the equality legislation. We have the public sector duty and the 2014 equality legislation in the 26 counties and we have a different set of equality legislation in Northern Ireland. And what those diversity of legislation has created the conditions to maintain an inequality and poverty for many people, including Irish travellers. And what we would like to see in a united Ireland is creating the conditions that we're not just talking, and I acknowledge and appreciate the challenges for all young people, but the young people that will never get to knock on the door of a third level institution, that will not get to have proper accommodation, the young people who will remain homeless and experience dire poverty for the rest of their lives will have that embedded and much stronger legislation, and not like Lorraine talked about looking for crumbs from the table, which is what I see many in the community and voluntary sector do all the time, that we have embedded anti-poverty programs, community development programs across the island of Ireland where all of us are committed to equality, as Sean McBride referred to earlier on. You know, it's equality for all is what we need to be seeking to achieve. And we need all the economic, social and health things to happen, but we also need to embed good, decent and quality legislation and we also need to embed community development, anti-poverty and we need not to talk in relation to some communities, we need to be talking about all. And with the diversity, we've seen a rise in the right and we do not need a splintered society. A new Assembly for Ireland need to make sure that we represent all and that we are bringing everybody with us and we don't create another form of hatred or splintering, that we have a society that's based on trust and equality, fairness and social justice and anti-racism. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, just on what Paul was saying there, just thank you for singing our praises. Um, I just want to say that today was the first day that I got a call from a mother from Kildare uh, looking to sort accommodation for her wee daughter, and it's only February. Um, they're making their choices on where they go to where they go to get their third level education based on where they can get a place to live and not want to what they want to go and study. Um, just on, on the people that I went to secondary school with as well, um, a lot of them would have went off to your Galways and Dublins and Manus, and they're all coming back here to Donegal now because, not just because of the, the price of the accommodation, but they can't find anywhere. Um, so what I believe needs to be done is, you know, remove them barriers, create the, incentive, uh, create the incentives to look at, um, to create accommodation, but not only create accommodation, but like there's already, there's already existing housing uh, in the county, um, and we need to protect that there for students and, you know, put more incentives in place to look after our students. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, good evening. My name is Mo Farah, and I'm one of the uh, Donegal residents, and in terms, uh, especially Letakini. And myself, I'm a migrant person, and I live in Letakini. Uh, my background is human rights, and I am a human rights defender myself, and I have been working for human rights for 50 years. Uh, so I just need to point out uh, what uh, she said, uh, Madam, uh, about the equality and diversity. Uh, 
in Ireland, I think what I have seen last time, National Statistics Office, um, around 12% of people uh, in Ireland are, have some kind of disability. Um, when I have come up, when I arrived in Ireland, there is a lot of inaccessible roads and inaccessible uh, uh, accommodations, and also there is a too much reasonable accommodation in houses in entirely uh, Donegal and entirely Ireland so far. So even the transportation and infrastructures, and people with disability is a big number of the community in terms of, uh, for example, as, as I mentioned, it is almost 12% of the people of the island, around 600 plus, 600,000 plus in Ireland. So I just saw that I recommended that uh, the United, the future United Ireland will be in put an account that uh, removing the barrier of people with disability and also uh, uh, make inclusive for all for all people with disability in the country. Another another thing that just I wanted to mention is about uh, migrants and how it will be the migrants who are coming in Ireland in the future. I know every person knows the last development, the last two months, what is going on in the media. There are a lot of protesters and rights that are against the migrants. So it is myself, I'm a migrant person, and I come from a, uh, a Somalia, where a war torn and, and there is a fighting and conflict. And everyone who's coming to this country is not coming for to relax and to get a, uh, or we cannot say all of them, we, they are economic migrants who are coming to this country. But there is a lot of people who are leaving uh, some way to survive their service. Uh, for example, myself, I have been living where my life is threatening. I didn't, uh, I didn't had a bad, uh, bad economic, or I didn't had uh, something very bad in my economic. But I have a good life in my country. I had a car. I have leading in a big organization who assists and advocate for people with disability and elderly people, uh, and. The reason I come here in Ireland and to join the people of Ireland is to get survived to myself. So I think we need the future of United Ireland to make sure every person has a right to have a better life in this country. Ireland has ratified, has signed the UN Convention of Refugees in 1952 after one year of that, of that confession issued. And they ratified in 1956. So I hope uh, to everyone to have equal access, equal opportunity, and better, uh, and, and everyone to have, to become inclusive for all. So uh, I just need to point that point is, and I like to be the new United Ireland will be assured all those rights as same right to the other citizens who are not uh, who are who are not immigrants and same better life to all of us thank you so much i know you already assured some kind of equality because i'm here i'm a migrant i'm a black and i'm also disabled using a wheelchair so that makes it so far there's uh, some kind of positive uh, positive a uh, positive, positive, positive kind of uh, what I have seen so far because of I was invited here to speak in front of you, to listen, to contribute, and that's what you wanted to be Alan in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, we're coming towards the end now, and maybe I'd like to ask, um, maybe to you, Noel, what would your vision be for, for, for the future, and um, how would you see that things might be brought forward from where we are now? Well, um, listening to all of the comments and the very interesting angles that everybody's coming from, I think that we're, we're well placed here as a society, that we're thinking about one another and not just for ourselves. Um, in relation to just talking about housing, the crisis that we have in this country at the moment is, it's dreadful, it's, it's, it's beyond words. And in a new Ireland, we need to have enshrined in the constitution 
the right to a home? And, and that home has to be for everybody. That home has to include all our new citizens that are coming to this country. These citizens that now have a vote, these citizens that are in the north or in the south can influence possibly the balance of power on a border pole. When you think of the number of people that have arrived into this country, these people have to be included along with our traveling community who are always um, kind of brought in in the rear and are spoken to as if, but we know. It's like the, the travelers are tolerated. And I take your point absolutely about that. Also your point as well in relation to coming into the country and finding that, are we getting a better place to live in? Because if you're living down in Dublin in particular, we're back to tenements. We're back to James Plunkett in Strumpet City. And this is in 2023. We've got people living in bedrooms and bedrooms and beds and top of beds. We've got people leaving a bed with a person coming off night duty to go and sleep in that bed. What sort of society are we creating there? So a new Ireland for me has to be something that is built absolutely on equality. Access to a healthcare system, we have to develop a healthcare system. Unfortunately in the UK, the healthcare system is becoming more privatised. Here we've got the ability of sludge care, and um, you mentioned as well, um, so you did, um, Pierce, in relation to, can we have a healthcare system free at the point of delivery? Yes. And we have to, we're going to have to pay for it, but it has to be equal, we have to tax the rich more, we have to make sure that we provide equality of access according to your need. And if we can do that, we can start developing and expanding that into our educational system. The education system here in the Republic, people turned around when I moved here and said, but you're going to send your kids to Derry, aren't you? Because Northerners have this impression that they've got a better educational system. Rubbish. <laughs> My child did not have to sit the 11 plus, which is abuse of a child at that age. Our sons had the opportunity of transition year. Our sons went to a co-education, multi-denominational school. And our children, when they were sitting there leaving cert, had the option of doing a vocational leaving cert or a straight leaving cert. Mm -hmm. And they also were studying maths, English, Irish. They were at least seven subjects as opposed to two or three A-levels. So we've got a lot to offer. Don't put ourselves down. The North has got its strengths, and all I'm saying, and the New Ireland, we work to those strengths. We applaud all of our strengths, and we work in partnership, however that might pan out. Thank you. Seamus, do you want to come in? Yeah, I suppose I, I'm thinking maybe more about the how rather than the what, and Noelle has articulated the what uh, from her perspective very, very well. Um, I think the how maybe is about listening to communities, trying to figure out where communities have already agreed they want to go to and capture that. And I think we all need to be prepared not to end up where we thought we wanted to go to, but maybe a better place where, where, where we've learned along the way that the destination needs to be a little bit different than what we thought it would be, but it's broadly the same place. So it's, it's about listening to communities, capturing that, take it in stages, and not looking only at, at projects for projects' sake, but looking how they also fit into the totality of it. I suppose one of the things I've just been listening to and thinking about in my mind, and I know that Paul and I and others have talked about it extensively, we, as parents, we probably have something to think about as well to encourage our children to, to want to deliver in the practicalities of things that need to be done. We talk about what needs to happen on the building side. We talk about infrastructure. Yet we, over the last 20 years, particularly in places like Donegal, we felt the need to push children to go to third level academic as opposed to third level practical. And that's probably someone we all need to think about is to think about developing the practical skills again because they're very badly needed at the moment as well. I think one of the things if you'd make it, you know, keep it simple and think about the advice that a parent, you know, or as, as a young parent, somebody gave me advice was, you know, give your children uh, wings to fly and roots to know where home is. 
I think we do that very well in this part of the world because you know, we're punching above our weight. We really, really are. And you know, I think if you take it from that, you know, at a citizen level, at a community level, you know, what we need to work at in the future is understanding the difference between what we want and what we need. And I know it's a mantra in our house that my husband often said to our teenagers, you know, I'm focusing, I'll, I'll give you, you know, you, you, we'll give you opportunities, we'll support you, but there is sometimes a difference between what you want and what you need. And I think that's, the, that's where we need to change the dial. So if we're going to accommodate all of the differences, if we need to build reconciliation, we must build and continue to build on reconciliation. And it is an absolute need for all of us to share this space. And I'm optimistic about the future, Michal, I, I, I really am. And I think as, as a region, uh, the city region of Donegal and the border countries in Derry, you know, we have been punching above our weight. And I think that in a new uh, dispensation and a new conversation, we have been, we've had to make it work in the border regions. And I think we're in a much, much stronger place than, you know, and we do have the issues of the infrastructure. And we, you know, I'm saying outside that my granny came from Sligo to Derry on the train 100 years ago uh, to finish her education at 15. You know, I would love for my granddaughter in 25 years time to be able to get this train down to the ATU in Sligo. Wouldn't that be marvelous? And I think that is the, and there's no point, you know, you've talked about the cancer services. We can't have cancer services in every hole in the hedge. If you want to get cancer treatment, and unfortunately, you know, our family has been through that too, you, know, you want to have the very best person. And where, you know, we can't have, for a population of six million, have that everywhere. But there's no point having that 300 kilometers away if you don't have access to public transport. Mm -hmm. And so the two things go hand in hand. You can't have a conversation about public services without having the infrastructure to connect it. But, you know, we, we are doing well and we do need to keep our glass half full and, you know, put our hat at it. I think Frank O'Connor in the, in the story about the wee fellow going across the field and he saw the orchard and he threw his cap over the wall. And I think there's a bit of that. We need to put our cap over the wall and go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose just thinking as the conversation was going on, I came back to, I'm originally from Ballyshannon, but I came back to Letterkenny in 1998, a couple of months before the Good Friday Agreement was actually agreed at that stage. I remember sitting in a graveyard in a scheme. Jeez, I'm really close to the border no matter where I go. <laughs> but I was in a graveyard in a scheme waiting for a relation to come home from England uh, late on Holy Thursday night before the agreement was signed. And it just sticks in my head at that stage, you know, where we were at that time and what has happened in the meantime and the progress that has been made. Albeit, you know, we've mentioned a lot of issues and problems that need to be dealt with, but if you look at the progress that's been made over that period of time and how quickly that 25 years has gone by, well, in my head, it's gone by really quickly anyway. And, you know, I think if we continue to make the progress we have done, obviously, you know, we've moved, we've moved a lot of the obstacles that are in our way to move forward a little bit quicker than we have over the last 25 years. But hopefully with the momentum that we have and, you know, the goodwill that people have to make this work, I think we can be really optimistic about the future and I'm uh, optimist, optimist by nature anyway, but I think I'm really optimistic about the future because you can see how much it means to people. And when I'm working with young people on a day-to-day -day basis, they already get it. They don't have to be convinced about anything. You know, they don't remember the Good Friday Agreement, they don't have anything, don't remember what went before that. They're about the future, about the, you know, what we were talking about earlier on, about the planet, about the climate change, about the equality, diversity, inclusion. That's their agenda. And we've got to work towards that, and I think we're looking forward to a really, really good country for the, for the future. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what to add to all that now. You should have been in the graveyard, then it's game. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Stay away from the graveyard. <laughs> I suppose, uh, it's back to, I suppose the Good Friday Agreement, and Paul sort of said that, that feeling and that emotion that we went through at that stage in our lives. Um, I don't want young people, I suppose young kids now, to have to even think about that. I don't want them to, to have to say, I'm orange and green or whatever, you know, or that's a political decision because of orange and green. And that would be, if I even listen, I, kids don't care anymore about that, as far as I can see. A lot of them don't. Um, and they didn't live through it. So my, my future would be, my future for Ireland would be that they have opportunities and they can pick whatever opportunity they want. They can do it at home if they want, they can go abroad if they want, but that they, I suppose, your, your point of roots 
but that they don't have to go through any of that sectarianism ever again. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's, I think that would be what we fought for mm -hmm. to a certain extent in, in getting the Good Friday Agreement one yes, years ago. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the panel very much for, um, for sharing their insights and um, their experience with us here this evening. I think you'll all agree that it's been a useful, that it's been a very beneficial um, session. Um, I think tonight's meeting demonstrates that the people of Donegal do want to have their say and are taking the opportunity to have their say um, here and whatever contributions might be made online and so on. I think that um, we've ended, I think, on a fairly positive note here tonight from people that are at the cold face um, working at this for years and from yourselves that are living this day to day. So I'd just like to, um, again, thank you all for being here and for your participation. I'd like to thank Rosa very much for her assistance tonight. I'd like to thank Emma and Anya and the organizers of this event for, for all of the work that went into enabling us here to be here tonight. So, Gurumila Mahagav for the Sihawa. I thought it was a powerful uh, event tonight. Uh, just voices from all across different sectors, communities, and Donegal. And I think in the room, collectively, you could see a vision for what a new Ireland can look like. This is really exciting time for our people. Uh, we need to uh, not uh, take what's failed in the 26 counties or what's failed in the six counties and lump it together. We need the best uh, of both and we need to have a new health system, a new education system, a stronger economy uh, and one that looks after all of our people and our community. So it's all, uh, it's all for winning and tonight I think was a very inspirational night. I, I really look forward to seeing this uh, taking place in towns and counties all across this island. This is critically important.